Hello everyone, I'm Dr. James Ferretti, an emergency and overnight radiologist with Progressive Physician Associates in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania in the United States. And today I have a lecture for you on MR imaging of liver lesions, diagnostic tips, tricks, and pitfalls. So I have a slide of objectives here, but because we're short on time, I'm not gonna go through this whole thing. What I invite you to do is just sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. So liver lesion differentials. Whenever you see a hepatic lesion, here are a few things that you might consider in the differential. I'm not gonna read them all to you, but you can see there's a lot of things that it could be. And these are just to name a few, but going through all of that is a whole different lecture. Today, I wanna get back to basics in the liver. So let's talk about the hepatic vascular system first and foremost. So the circulatory system of the liver is unlike that in any other organ. The majority of the liver's blood supply is venous blood. And specifically about 75% of the blood entering the liver is venous blood from the portal vein. And that includes venous blood returning from most of the colon, the small intestine, the stomach, the pancreas, and the spleen. And this essentially gives the liver first pass at nearly all materials absorbed by the digestive tract. Now, because of this, it's not uncommon to see a secondary hepatitis in the setting of other infectious or inflammatory processes in the abdomen, such as pancreatitis, enteritis, appendicitis, diverticulitis, colitis, and including inflammatory bowel disease, and any other kind of itis, really. So in these settings, inflammatory mediators get released into the blood and they hitch a ride to the liver and they can cause inflammation of the liver as a secondary hepatitis. When this occurs, it can manifest itself clinically with right upper quadrant pain, elevated liver enzymes, and on imaging with a heterogeneous appearance of the liver due to edema and inflammation. And I'll show you an example of this in a minute. This is just something to keep in mind when clinicians keep looking for disease in the liver in a patient with pancreatitis, enteritis, appendicitis, diverticulitis, colitis, Keep in mind the liver might just be an innocent bystander, despite the clinical symptoms in abnormal labs. The process may be originating somewhere else. For completeness sake, the remaining 25% of the blood supply to the liver is, as you might have guessed, arterial blood from the hepatic artery. Okay, hepatitis. That's any process causing inflammation of the liver, usually infectious, with viral infection being the most frequently encountered, and any insult to the liver can kill hepatocytes and recruit inflammatory cells. So that's hepatitis. Here is hepatitis on MR. And we see coronal T2 imaging with heterogeneous increased signal, and that's edema in the liver. And then on the post-contrast images over here, the arterial post-contrast image shows patchy heterogeneous enhancement, which then resolves on the portal venous phase imaging, and this is consistent with hepatic inflammation. Let's talk about cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is caused by progressive diffuse fibrosis and hepatocellular death with nodular hepatocyte regeneration in response to some insult to the liver. Usually this is due to alcohol use in the U.S. And in the U.S. we do try to counsel our patients to decrease their alcohol intake. And some of them are more willing to do that than others. So my doctor said only one glass of alcohol a day. I can live with that. Well, you know, at least he's trying. Now, other major causes 
of cirrhosis include chronic inflammation or hepatitis, like we talked about, biliary disease, hemochromatosis. The end result is distortion of the hepatic architecture, severe compromise in the delivery of blood to the liver cells, disruption of the ability of the liver cells to secrete substances into the plasma, and obliteration of the biliary channel. So the liver may appear healthy in the earliest stages of cirrhosis, but eventually the surface contour of the liver becomes irregular, lobulated, or nodular. And with progressive cirrhosis, the liver volume decreases and the liver becomes shrunken and deformed, like we see here. So again, we have T2-weighted images and T1 post-contrast arterial phase images, and we see a nodular contour of the liver with some T2 bright, T1 dark ascites. And then on the post-contrast imaging, we see innumerable small non-enhancing hepatic nodules and that's kind of how cirrhosis works so let's talk about the nodules in cirrhosis you can have either regenerative nodules dysplastic nodules or hepatocellular carcinoma regenerative nodules are usually less than a centimeter in size and they're variable in appearance some of them can accumulate iron and become siderotic nodules with associated blooming artifact on t2 star and gradient imaging and these don't enhance so here are examples of some regenerative nodules, small focal regenerative nodules, hypo-intense on T2 and post-contrast T1, no associated enhancement. So dysplastic nodules are usually greater than a centimeter in size, and they have a variable appearance. Usually they're T1 hyper-intense, but they're usually T2 dark or T2 hypo-intense, and that's important. So low-grade dysplastic nodules do not enhance. The presence of T2 hyperintensity and or contrast enhancement on the arterial phase images should increase suspicion of transition to high grade dysplasia and that warrants either a close follow up or a biopsy. And here we have axial T1 images on the top and T1 post contrast images on the bottom and we see multiple small focal dysplastic nodules. They're bright on T1. On the T2 images that I didn't show you, uh, the lesions had low signal intensity and there was no associated enhancement. Okay, dysplastic nodules transitioning to HCC. Dysplastic nodules transitioning to or containing a subfocus of hepatocellular carcinoma can show a characteristic nodule within a nodule appearance. The focus of hepatocellular carcinoma will appear as T2 bright within the normally T2 dark dysplastic nodule. And the focus of hepatocellular carcinoma will show arterial phase enhancement on the post-contrast T1 weighted image. Contrast washout of the lesion was also seen here on the more delayed images. So we see that there is T2 hyperintensity and post contrast enhancement with washout. Let's talk about fibrosis with cirrhosis. So, typical findings uh, on MR with fibrosis T1 hypo intensity, T2 hyperintensity usually and they can have a diffuse or geographic appearance. So here we see a kind of wedge-shaped area of T1 hypo-intensity, T2 hyper-intensity here. And then on the post-contrast imaging, we see some heterogeneous uh, post-contrast enhancement in the arterial phase with progressive enhancement, which persists on the more delayed phase imaging. And if you look, you can see kind of reticular areas of post-contrast enhancement as well, all consistent with focal and diffuse hepatic cirrhosis, uh, cirrhosis with fibrosis. Now, we have our hepatic fibrosis on the left here. What if we start seeing more heterogeneity, aggressive features, and biliary ductal dilatation, like the image on the right? So it looks similar, but now it's getting more aggressive. We have biliary ductal dilatation. What are we worried about then? Not just fibrosis, but yeah, cholangiocarcinoma. So that's one way you can tell the difference. If fibrosis starts getting more aggressive or looks more aggressive, start thinking about cholangiocarcinoma. Now let's talk hepatocellular carcinoma. But first, let's review the number one rule of hepatic cirrhosis. With any enhancing lesion in the cirrhotic liver, the primary differential consideration is HCC until proven otherwise. If I see an enhancing lesion in the liver, in a patient with cirrhosis, I need a compelling reason to call it something other than HCC. That is my primary differential consideration. That's also my second consideration and my third consideration. But, so some more on hepatocellular carcinoma, some things you probably already know. Most common primary hepatic cancer, 
occurs typically in the setting of cirrhosis and chronic liver disease. You can see elevated alpha fetoprotein levels in up to 95% of the cases. Something else to keep in mind is that alpha fetoprotein can also be elevated in the setting of chronic hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So the higher the level of alpha fetoprotein elevation, the more suspicious you should be. And hepatocellular cancer likes to invade vessels like the portal vein. So look for enhancing thrombus. That's a more specific finding for HCC. Typically older patients, rarely do they calcify. And then there is HCC's cousin, fibrolamellar HCC, which typically occurs in younger patients, no cirrhosis, normal alpha fetoprotein levels. You can see calcifications with that and the central scar. So theoretically, fibrolamellar HCC can look like focal nodular hyperplasia, but overall will have a more nasty and aggressive appearance, and we'll see examples of that later. So here is an MRI of hepatocellular carcinoma. In this patient with hepatitis C and mild cirrhosis, we see the T2-weighted image, and we see a mildly heterogeneously hyperintense lesion with bright arterial enhancement. And here, on the more delayed post-contrast image, the lesion demonstrates contrast washout, so it becomes hypo-intense to the background liver. It doesn't just go back to the background, it actually becomes darker than the background liver. There is also some capsular rim enhancement here. So remember, the four typical features of hepatocellular carcinoma on MR. You may not see all of them, but the more you see, the more suspicious for HCC you should be. And those are T2 hyperintensity, arterial post-contrast enhancement, portal venous or delayed phase washout, where the lesion becomes darker than the background liver, and then portal venous or delayed capsular or rim enhancement. These four combine with the size of the lesion is basically lyrads in a nutshell, but I want you to know and be able to name the specific suspicious features of HCC. Now, HCC can be heterogeneous too. Here we see a T1 hypointense lesion, heterogeneous T2 hyperintensity, and then arterial phase contrast enhancement with associated washout and capsular enhancement as well. Now, what about fibrolamellar HCC? Well, fibrolamellar HCC is an unusual variant of hepatocellular carcinoma. Usually these are larger, solitary, and they exist in younger patients without coexistent liver disease or cirrhosis. Usually there's no elevated alpha fetal protein. Up to 60 to 90% of them can contain calcifications. There is a better prognosis than typical HCC, although this is still a malignancy. Typical features, T1 dark, heterogeneously T2 bright, and then heterogeneous enhancement on the arterial and venous phase images. And then that central scar, typically T1 dark, T2 dark as well, and then variable delayed enhancement. So here it is, hypo-intense, heterogeneously T2 bright with hypo-intense central scar. And then here in the arterial and post-contrast phase images, heterogeneous enhancement with hypo-enhancement of the central scar, but you'll note that there are some areas of washout within the lesion itself still. Now, fibrolamellar HCC versus FNH, full disclosure. Contrast enhancement within the central scar of fibrolamellar HCC can be variable. Older reports suggested that the central scar does not enhance, but subsequent studies have shown that delayed enhancement of the central scar may be seen in up to 65%. So delayed enhancement of the scar can sometimes raise the question of potentially adding focal nodular hyperplasia, which is a benign lesion to the differential. Let's talk about focal nodular hyperplasia a little bit. This is a common benign tumor of the liver containing cupfer cells, hepatocytes, and biliary structures thought to represent hyperplastic response of the liver parenchyma to a pre-existing vascular malformation, most commonly seen in women of reproductive age, mean size five centimeters. So fibrous bands and a central stellate scar are characteristic and fibrolamellar HCC can have these too. So typically the lesion is T1 isointense or slightly dark, or T2 and T2 isointense is slightly bright compared to the liver. Post contrast wise, marked arterial phase enhancement is seen, and then usually it'll go back to the background on the portal venous images. It may be slightly hyperintense on delayed phase images. The central scar can be key. Usually it's T1 dark, T2 bright, and the scar is usually hypo intense on arterial phase imaging with enhancement on the delayed phase imaging. So here, kind of T1 heterogeneously hypo-intense, T2 bright, central scar is bright on T2. Then post-contrast wise marked arterial post-contrast phase enhancement, 
kind of goes back to the background on the more delayed enhanced images, although you can still see it, and we see hyperintensity of that central scar. As a general rule, with fibrolamellar HCC versus FNH, any aggressive or malignant features like adenopathy, calcifications, evidence of necrosis, metastatic disease strongly suggests fibrolamellar HCC, but let's dig a little deeper. So let's see an example of some of the differences between FNH and fibrolamellar HCC. So here is FNH, and we can see homogeneous arterial enhancement. They call it the ghost lesion because usually on portal venous and delayed imaging, you don't see it so well, not aggressive and well-defined. The central scar is usually T2 bright. And then FNH also takes up sulfur colloid, about 80% of them. And of course, there's hepatobiliary agent like Eovist or Primavist uptake. Now here is a fibrolamellar HCC, and you can see heterogeneous arterial and portal venous enhancement, irregular and aggressive features like invasion and adenopathy, calcifications. Usually the scar is T2 dark, and then no sulfur colloid uptake, no or rarely heterogeneous hepatobiliary uptake, and these are also gallium avid, so that's another way to differentiate them. So let's talk about hepatobiliary agents, Eovist, Primavist. That's a gadolinium-based contrast agent, very similar to other MR gadolinium-based contrast agents, but is also partially taken up by hepatocytes and is excreted into the biliary system. So typical imaging sequences include your kind of standard late arterial phase, portal venous phase, and late dynamic phase, like you get with regular gadolinium, but also a fourth set of images in the hepatobiliary phase about 15 to 20 minutes after injection with patients with normal hepatic function. And hepatic enhancement generally persists for about two hours following injection, so that's a relatively large window for imaging. So the four main uses for hepatobiliary agents, and again, remember, this agent's taken up by normal and hyperplastic hepatocytes, and usually not by malignant hepatocytes like with hepatocellular carcinoma. So you can use it to evaluate for suspected liver mets with MRCP to exclude biliary obstruction, like in the setting of common bile duct or cystic duct stone, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, HIV, radiation, post-surgical uh, biliary obstruction or stricturing, to evaluate focal nodular hyperplasia, and to evaluate a real hepatic lesion versus a pseudo lesion. So here is FNH with EOVIST. And again, we can see heterogeneous iso-intense lesion on T1, T2 hyperintense with a hyperintense central scar, arterial phase, intense enhancement, going back to the background, maybe some central scar enhancement here on the more delayed phase images, but here is the differentiator on the hepatobiliary phase images, persistent contrast uptake in the focal nodular hyperplasia, very characteristic. Now, we talked about hepatobiliary agents and evaluation for suspected liver mets. Why is this? Well, METs don't contain hepatocytes, and it's easier to see dark lesions on a bright liver background. Here, we have a known metastatic lesion that, we, that was seen on CAT scan, pre-contrast imaging, T1 dark, arterial phase, heterogeneous enhancement, portal venous phase kind of goes hypo-intense and stays hypo-intense on that dynamic phase, and then even more hypo-intense on the hepatobiliary phase, but we also see these three other lesions, which turned out to be additional metastatic disease, which are not very easily identified on the other imaging. So some more on hepatobiliary agents. Eovist and Primavist can be a great diagnostic tool to add to the MR arsenal. That is until they completely confuse the heck out of you. How? Well, I'm glad you asked. So here, this should not be a diagnostic dilemma for most of you. We have a T2 bright, well-defined lesion, nodular progressive enhancement over time with central filling. What is this? Hopefully everybody's thinking hemangioma, slam dunk. Now you'll note that the hemangioma doesn't completely fill on the delayed post-contrast images. That's probably secondary to hyalinization or clot. This does not alter the diagnosis. Now the main point of this slide is just to tell you something that we already know. Hemangiomas are common, and here's another example. T1 dark, T2 bright, arterial phase peripheral nodular enhancement with filling in, and then persistent post-contrast enhancement due to slow flow. Now let's talk about hemangioma hepatobiliary agent appearance. This is where it gets a little tricky. So still hypo-intense on T1, hyper-intense on T2, but on the post-contrast phases, it gets a little different. So these are both hemangiomas, but you'll note that they show heterogeneous enhancement. And then on the portal venous phase imaging, we start to lose that enhancement. So it almost looks like it's washing out. 
And this is a pitfall because the hemangioma appearance closely mimics the washout appearance of HCC, especially if the patient has cirrhosis. These can also look similar to metastatic disease, adenomas, and lots of other things. So basically, if you rely solely on hepatobiliary contrast agent imaging alone, you might confuse what's usually a slam dunk diagnosis of hemangioma for something else, including malignant lesions, and that's not good. Now, you still might be able to figure it out and figure out the lesions of hemangioma, but it's a lot trickier. Trust me on this. So I advise against using hepatobiliary agents for the first scan in the setting of cirrhosis and or roulette HCC. I do have no objection to hepatobiliary contrast agents on follow-up scans. However, if the hepatobiliary agent MR is all you have, all hope is not lost. One trick is to draw an ROI on the lesion and then another on the portal vein. Signal intensity within the lesion matching the portal vein on the vascular and hepatobiliary phase images is a characteristic feature of hemangioma with hepatobiliary agents, so they should match up. If you can do that and the rest of the features match, you can still be pretty sure that you're dealing with a hemangioma. It's not as straightforward as with regular gadolinium-based agents, but you can still figure it out. It's just a lot tougher. So that is the presentation. Thank you for your attention. I hope this was helpful to you. I hope you enjoyed. If you like this sort of thing, uh, I invite you to visit the Uncle Jimmy Radiology website, which is currently under construction, but will be loaded up with course materials and lectures just like this and more in the coming months. Um, and if I can ever be assistance to any of you, please reach out at Uncle Jimmy at Uncle Jimmy Radiology.com. I would love. Thank you very much, Dr. James. Uh, it was really informative talk. And uh, now I would like to introduce Dr. Amar Sarwar, who is Assistant Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School, Boston, Massachusetts, United States. He is also co-director of Liver Tumor Program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And in addition, he's a visiting interventional radiologist at Doctors Hospital, Lahore, Pakistan. And he's going to talk on liver tumors and liver-directed therapies. So welcome, Dr. Uh, Amar. And we're just going to start his uh, pre-recorded video and he will be available for questions later on. Hi, everybody. My name is Amar Sarwar. I'm a director of the liver cancer program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak about liver tumors and liver-directed therapies. So I'm going to try to provide a quick overview of the current status for treatment options for um, liver-directed therapy. Uh, we're not going to be talking about uh, surgical options, uh, such as those involving uh, uh, transplantation or resection. We'll be focusing more on local regional therapies, including ethanol injection, RFA, and microwave ablation, which are the most commonly used therapies, transarterial and, uh, embolization and transarterial chemoembolization, as well as radioembolization. Um, those will be the focus of this talk. So we'll start by talking about ethanol injections. So ethanol injections were first introduced in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the mechanism of action is uh, that it induces uh, coagulative necrosis of the tumor. Ethanol remains in the tumor since HCC consistency is softer than the cirrhotic liver. It also induces thrombosis of the vessels, and it can have a sterilizing action as the uh, ethanol is injected when the needle is withdrawn, which can prevent seeding. For its technique, it requires real-time ultrasound guidance, uh, but uh, typically it requires multiple sessions under local anesthesia, one to eight ml uh, of ethanol per sessions, and sometimes uh, up to two sessions per week. Uh, there have been some um, advances, such as the use of a multi-pronged needle, um, uh, known as quadrifuse, which allows for even distribution of ethanol throughout the tumor. However, multiple randomized control trials and meta-analyses have demonstrated that the efficacy for radiofrequency ablation is greater than uh, percutaneous ethanol ablation. And the main uh, benefit of this uh, RFA is seen at three years after uh, ethanol injection. And this is because typically with RFA, there's a less chance of local recurrence, uh, and that risk is higher with ethanol ablation. Um, however, uh, it is important to note that RFA is more expensive than percutaneous ethanol uh, injection. In terms of adverse events, the most common adverse events are a local hot sensation or pain, 
transient drunkenness can occur, especially if you inject a lot of ethanol um, directly into the bloodstream. Um, and fever on the day of the procedure is possible. Uncommon adverse effects that have been described include seeding of the HCC to the abdominal wall, bilious strictures, and a damage to either the bowel or uh, the gallbladder. Ethanol injections is no longer recommended in the United States due to the significantly better prognosis with other therapies such as RFA. Um, however, this may be of some use in resource limited settings as it costs significantly less than other local therapies and does not require a lot of equipment. But I think it is important to note that you can't use this as a one time therapy. Uh, each tumor needs to be treated at least two or three times in order to make sure that the chances of local recurrence are really low. I'm going to move on to radiofrequency ablation. So tumor ablation is the administration of focal cytotoxic injury to tumor cells. The goal is to kill all tumor cells in the tumor plus a margin of normal tissue um, while limiting damage to non-tumoral structures. These are typically needle-based therapies. I think it's important to think about the concept of the ablated margin. Um, there's known microscopic extension of the tumor across, um, distal to the uh, normal appearing tissue. For HCC, these days, uh, the the uh, current teaching is that about a centimeter of circumferential ablative margin should be obtained. If you have an incomplete uh, margin uh, on early imaging after HCC RFA, then there's a higher risk of local tumor progression. Um, these are some of the um, uh, randomized control trials comparing, uh, comparing ablation to uh, resection in both for overall survival as well as for recurrence-free survival up to four years out. There was no significant difference in this trial from Chen et al. in 2006 and this trial from Feng et al. in um, uh, 2012. The study from Huang uh, uh, did show some evidence of uh, um, uh, improved uh, survival in patients undergoing surgery with five-year survival of 76% for surgical candidates compared to 55% for RFA. However, five-year survival data since the early 2000s has been improving. Five, reported five-year survival used to be up to 64% up until 2007, but in more recent studies, it has creeped up to 76% all the way up to 86%. And the reason why it has increased uh, is related to technique. So the use of combined CT and ultrasound guidance and making sure that there's a large enough uh, ablative margin has reduced the recurrence rates and improved survival. We're also able to do ablation now for tumors uh, that were previously in difficult location. This is an example of a patient with an HCC near the dome. And so the dome is often thought about an, uh, as an un unablatable area, but here on the six month MRI, you can see uh, a complete response uh, for this tumor. Similarly, tumors in the subcapsular location were previously thought to be unablatable by, by repositioning the patient and using a combination of CT and ultrasound guidance, you're able to um, ablate these pretty effectively. And then finally, for tumors that are sitting next to the stomach, the colon, or the gallbladder, you can use mechanical displacement, introduction of saline fluid mixed with contrast to separate the colon from the liver, uh, or the introduction of air to separate out the gallbladder from the, um, uh, from the liver and, and perform ablations in these areas. An additional technique to uh, be aware of, so, so far ablation is typically limited for the less than three centimeter tumors, but for three to five centimeter tumors, there's good evidence both from the basic science literature as well as from clinical research that shows that by performing chemoembolization and then following it by ablation can get you um, excellent responses. Uh, this is a prospective randomized control trials, uh, which showed that the taste plus uh, radiofrequency ablation was better than RF alone for three uh, to five centimeter tumors. And so here you can see uh, the improvement in overall survival as well as recurrence free survival for the blue bar, which is the taste plus RFA bar. There's since been another randomized control trial that shows the benefit of this approach. Moving along, uh, talking about microwave ablation, this is a newer technology, which is very similar to thermal uh, to RFA in that it induces thermal ablation. Uh, the key differences here are that um, microwave ablation has higher intratumoral pressures, less periprocedural pain, has a more predictable ablation zone, 
and is less susceptible to the heat sink effect. The heat sink effect is what occurs when you try to ablate a tumor that is sitting next to a blood vessel. The blood vessel using convection is taking the heat continuously away from the probe, uh, and that can uh, reduce the ablative um, uh, effect on the tumor itself and can have uh, residual disease left behind. Uh, microwave also has a shorter, shorter procedural time and a larger ablation volume. Uh, and so for all of these reasons, it is thought to be a better technology than RFA. There's been at least 20 studies, uh, prospective, retrospective, as well as randomized control trials that have compared um, uh, microwave ablation to radio frequency ablation. And this meta-analysis that was published in 2019 showed that the one-year survival, three-year survival, and five-year survival was really similar between the patients undergoing microwave ablation uh, versus RFA. Gonna switch gears now and talk about transarterial embolization. So the rationale for intraarterial therapy for uh, liver tumors is that the normal liver typically gets about 75% of its blood supply from the portal vein uh, and 25% uh, of, uh, of its blood supply from the hepatic artery. However, tumors uh, will get 90% of their blood supply from the arteries and a much smaller contribution from the portal vein. And so this was a randomized trial of transarterial embolization compared to drug eluding bead chemoembolization. And here it's important to note that they used uh, escalating sizes of particles ranging from 300 to 500 microns all the way up to 700 to 900 microns, and then followed it up with a 100 micron PVA for complete embolization. This was compared to um, uh, LC beads, which is a brand name, uh, which were 100 to 300 microns in size and mixed with uh, doxorubicin. In this particular trial, there was no difference seen in progression-free survival or overall survival between transarterial embolization compared to Deptase. So this question is still uh, uh, the topic of extensive meetings at interventional oncology meetings. Uh, at the question of is taste better than bland embolization? Uh, the answer is unknown, but it's likely that uh, taste is better. Uh, general, in general conventional practice, taste is performed. Uh, um, and the reason for this is because the initial randomized control studies use taste versus supportive care. There is a study from uh, Malagari in 2010, uh, which compared Debtase to, to transarterial embolization, and they showed a better local response with longer time to compression, a longer time to progression and fewer recurrences for drug eluding bead taste. Uh, it is unknown whether the type of chemotherapy that we use for chemoembolization, whether that makes a difference or not. Moving on to transarterial chemoembolization, this is defined as the combination of infusion of concentrated doses of chemotherapeutic drugs uh, for localized drug delivery. The advantages are that there's high, high first pass extraction of the chemotherapy, increased contact time with the tumor and reduced systemic toxicity. This was, uh, TASE was approved based off of two landmark randomized control trials that showed improved one, two and three year survival compared to best supportive care. In traditional or conventional taste, ethiodized oil, also known as lipiodol, is mixed with the doxorubicin, and the oil acts as a drug carrier as well as a tumor-seeking and embolic agent. Typically, chemoembolization should be performed in a selective or segmental fashion, and the reason for this is that because multiple studies have shown that selective chemoembolization is associated with better tumor response state, lower side effects, reduced liver dysfunction, reduced rates of non-target embolization, and it's much better tolerated in high-risk patients. Moving on to drug-eluting bead taste. Uh, so um, drug-eluting bead taste was uh, introduced um, uh, in the uh, late 2000s, about 2007, 2008, because of its favorable pharmacokinetic profile, low plasma concentration, and higher tumor concentration of the chemotherapy. However, Multiple randomized studies have shown no benefit of drug eluding bead taste compared to conventional taste. So these are two randomized trials that showed no difference in overall survival. Um, there was some benefit seen in terms of complete response rate at three months and one month for conventional taste compared to drug eluding bead taste. But in these studies, drug eluding bead taste was better tolerated with uh, lesser adverse events. So overall, as we compare Deb taste to conventional taste, what we find is that there's no difference in survival, but if you're concerned that the patient is not going to tolerate uh, the therapy quite well, then doing Deb taste is reasonable. <laughs> 
Moving along, I'm gonna next talk about transarterial radioembolization. So transarterial radioembolization is an intraarterial therapy in which we provide radiation therapy uh, using a brachytherapy technique. The treatment goal is to selectively deliver a tumorcidal dose of beta radiation to the tumor while maintaining a low radiation dose to the normal liver tissue. There are two types of products, glass microspheres and resin microspheres. The main difference being that the glass microspheres have a higher amount of activity per sphere and have smaller uh, microspheres, whereas the resin microspheres are larger and have a uh, lower uh, activity uh, per microsphere. This is what the microspheres look like. They're about 32 microns in the average diameter. The yttrium 90 is permanently bound. The mean um, energy is 0.93 million electron volts, and the half-life is about 64 hours. The beads only provide radiation up to a centimeter from where they land in the tissue, so it's actually quite a safe therapy for um, caregivers. Because the liver tumoral diameter with the end arterial arteriolar diameter is about eight microns, resin microspheres get stuck in these end arterioles and provide radiation directly to the tumor. This procedure involves a four-step process. Uh, after getting labs and imaging and having a tumor bolt board consultation, uh, the patients typically need a planning arteriogram uh, with a nuclear medicine study to plan out and calculate the dose. Um, followed by the treatment arteriogram, which is to, uh, can occur a few days after the planning. During the planning arteriogram, we try to determine the lung shunt fraction uh, by injecting technetium 99 M, uh, MAA. Um, these particles are injected from the treatment position, and we know a certain percentage of all of the blood flow of the, to a tumor goes directly towards the lung. Uh, so we're trying to calculate that. This is an example of a lung shunt study in which a patient has a minimum lung shunt fraction. Uh, and this is an example of a patient who has a moderate lung shunt fraction. Once we've done this, we select a target absorbed dose, keeping in mind the dose to the tumor, the liver, and the lung. These are thresholds to keep in mind. So liver dose should be less than 70 to 80 gray. Lung dose should be less than 30 gray to prevent the risk of radiation pneumonitis. And the tumor absorbed dose should be greater than 100 gray in order to have the best tumor effect. This is what the product looks like when it arrives. It's basically drawn up by nuclear medicine department and uh, the dose that is being administered to the patient is collected. Uh, the dose is then brought to interventional radiology where a microcatheter is already connected and placed in the treatment position. And using this delivery system, the um, uh, microspheres are slowly delivered into uh, the tumor. Within radioembolization, certain techniques have taken uh, um, a root. This includes radiation segmentectomy, which is a curative technique when tumors are located in less than two segments, and we give a very high tumor absorbed dose. This is an example of a 68-year-old male with a 6.6 .6 centimeter HCC and normal LFTs. You can see the tumor right here in the dome of the liver. This is the pretreatment arteriogram in which we infuse 24 millicuries of radioembolic uh, material. And this is the post-treatment arteriogram, which shows brisk flow towards the tumor. Here, 18 months later, this six centimeter tumor has shrunk down to 2.7 centimeters. Uh, and this patient has had a complete response and is tumor free. Radiation segmentectomy has been shown to be effic efficacious in multiple studies. This is a key study of 70 solitary HCCs less than five centimeters in child's PUA patients in whom it was seen that the uh, um, median survival was close to about uh, six or seven years for patients with tumors less than three uh, um, centimeters and about uh, four to five years for patients with tumors greater than three centimeters. Here's another example of a 53-year-old male with a two centimeter segment six tumor who was referred for surgical resection but was noted to have portal vein tumor thrombus. This patient underwent Y90 planning in geography uh, which showed a nice tumor blush, which was followed by injection of radioembolization. After injection of radioembolization, basically um, uh, the tumor shrunk down and had a complete response on imaging and the patient underwent resection. Uh, during resection, they were not able to identify any large vessel invasion. Uh, so the tumor had basically retracted away from the portal vein uh, and this patient had a really good response. Radioembolization is now also available in Pakistan. 
We uh, performed a radioembolization in June 2021 for a 45 year old female with HCV cirrhosis uh, who had a performer status of zero with BCLCC disease, but no extrahepatic disease. Um, here you can see this patient's um, uh, CT, which shows an arterial enhancing tumor that is feeding into the main portal vein uh, over here. You can see this better on this coronal image. This tumor is entirely within the portal vein, which is it's expanding. We performed a radioembolization in Lahore uh, using a planning arteriography, an angio CT, and then a technetium 99 MAA injection. And this is the patient's three month scan where there's a complete response in the treated portal vein uh, branches uh, with a patent main portal vein. This patient is currently listed for transplantation. In the final two minutes, I'm just gonna briefly talk about hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma, which are the two primary tumors that are treated with lo local regional therapies. So for um, uh, HCC, I think everybody is well aware of the BCLC staging in which uh, transplantation, ablation, or resection are potentially curative treatments for stage A disease. Chemoembolization is uh, the mainstay for therapy for stage B disease. And systemic therapy or radioembolization is the uh, best therapy for state C disease. So um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to stop right here. Um, uh, it, for uh, we, I had a few slides on chemoembolization uh, for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. I think the main thing to know uh, is that um, combination therapy is becoming the uh, go-to uh, uh, treatment option for patients with cholangiocarcinoma. There was a recent phase two trial uh, which basically combined radioembolization with gemcitabine and cisplatin and demonstrated an excellent response. Uh, the primary outcome was research response rate uh, along with overall survival as a secondary response. The median overall survival using combination therapy was about 22 months and 22% of patients were downstaged to surgery. We've also demonstrated this at our center in Boston where 26 patients with large seven centimeter intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, uh, about 42% um, uh, were downstaged successfully to surgery. And there was greater than 90% necrosis of these tumors in 63% of patients. The overall median overall survival was about 25 months. Here's an example of a patient who underwent radioembolization for a left lobe intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma because it was too close to the um, uh, left hepatic vein. On pathology, this tumor, which was originally 13 centimeter, was uh, shrunk down to about 10 centimeters, and there was no residual microscopically identifiable non necrotic tumor uh, after radioembolization. Here's another patient in whom right lobe radioembolization shrunk the tumor and the right lobe to the size of the surgeon's palm. And so radioembolization is very effective in shrinking the size of tumors. So in conclusion, um, radio primary and metastatic malignancies can be effectively treated with liver-directed therapies. I think it's important to understand the mechanism of each therapy as well as available trial data to help select the optimal treatment uh, for each patient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marsalbar, uh, for giving us a brief yet comprehensive and detail of different uh, management options for hepatic disease. So, if you have got any questions, please hold on to those questions and uh, we will talk to Dr. Amar uh, towards the end of session. Thanks. And uh, now, our next presenter is Dr. Usman Mansoor, and he is a consultant neurointerventional radiologist at King Fahad Medical Center, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He had his fellowships in neuroradiology, vascular and interventional radiology, and neurointerventional radiology. And last but not least, he had his radiology training at our uh, institute, Shubhat Khanan Hospital. So uh, we will start watching his pre-recorded video and uh, then he will be available for questions later on. So please, uh, let's start his presentation. Hello. 
Greetings from Riyadh. I am Dr. Manzoor, one of the former residents at Short Khanam mm -hmm. Cancer Hospital. And uh, it is my pleasure to share my experience regarding functional imaging for brain tumors. And as a famous saying, old is gold, that is true for conventional MR imaging as well, which remains as the standard protocol for imaging any brain tumors. It gives us an immense information. These are the kind of uh, conventional images uh, which we get routinely. It tells you the location of the tumor, enhancement pattern surrounding the genic edema, there's any hemorrhage within the tumor as well, uh, cystic natures, necrosis. Uh, so we do get a lot of information from these conventional images. And uh, just talking briefly about why do we need functional imaging? Uh, one of the reasons obviously to add color to our black and white lives. And more importantly, for further characterization of the tumors. Uh, talking briefly about limitations of conventional imaging, uh, it is very good in evaluation the tumor as well itself, but the perifocal region, which is surrounding the tumor, it is very hard to um, get an idea what is going on on conventional imaging. Uh, if there is any evidence of tumor D differentiation, we can pick it up pretty early in, uh, with functional imaging as compared to the conventional imaging, which basically depends on uh, enhancement uh, to recognize tumor D differentiation, grading of the tumor. Most of the time, we can do a pretty good job with conventional imaging, but there are instances where we need uh, some more information, which is provided by functional imaging. And a very important question in our clinical practice, uh, particularly in an oncology center, is to differentiate between uh, radiation necrosis versus a true progression of the tumor. So um, these questions can be answered, a lot of them by functional imaging. They definitely aid in diagnosis. They can provide non-invasive prognostic biomarkers regarding the tumors. Uh, they definitely help a lot in treatment planning and uh, help us in the post-treatment phase to monitor the treatment as well as uh, for follow-up. Uh, there are a lot of functional imaging tools available and the most commonly used are MR spectroscopy. I personally like MR perfusion uh, the most. Uh, functional MRI uh, to see the, to locate the eloquent areas of the brain before surgery, DTI and PET scan. Uh, briefly talking about all of them um, regarding MR spectroscopy, um, what we are looking for there, it basically tells us the presence and concentration of uh, different metabolites within the brain parenchyma and in the tumoral tissue itself, wherever the voxel is placed. And primarily uh, for brain tumors, we are primarily concerned about four metabolites, which are choline, creatinine, creatine, and N-acetyl acetate and uh, lactates. Uh, NAA and choline are the most uh, important uh, metabolites which we look for the peaks on MR spectroscopy and uh, creatine is a relatively stable uh, metabolite which remains stable uh, even in the presence of tumors or other benign lesions and that is mostly used as a reference to look how NAA and choline peaks have behaved in reference to creatine. So NA is a, a marker, neuronal marker, neurotransmitter uh, which is basically tells us the presence of uh, intact neurons in that uh, voxel. And obviously, as you would imagine, its highest peak is within the normal brain tissue. And as the brain tissue gets replaced uh, by abnormal, glial, abnormal tumor cells, the NA would decrease. And once the normal neural tissue is completely replaced, NA peaks are usually very, very low. Choline, on the other hand, is a, a cell membrane product, and it does not tell us whether the cells are intact or damaged. Now, all it tells is that uh, there uh, are more cells in that region. Um, so in the presence of uh, densely tumor cells, which, are, uh, which have high mitosis, they will give us high choline. And even in the other uh, 
conditions uh, which can be inflammation, demyelination, there are broken cells, so choline will be still high. So this is a, a normal uh, MR spectroscopy. Uh, this is a hunter's um, angle where the choline is uh, more or less the same as uh, creatine. Creatine is usually the reference point to look for how the choline and NA are behaving and the highest uh, metabolic metabolite uh, present, the highest peak is NAA. And this is what happens with the tumors. Uh, if we can see, this is a low grade tumor, meaning that most of the glial neuronal tissue is still preserved and partially infiltrated by the tumor. So we can see um, NS tyrosinate is still high, but since there is a higher um, mitotic activity than the normal brain tissue. The choline uh, is increased in reference to creatine as well because of uh, increased or because of presence of more uh, cellular activity in that region. This is uh, on the contrary, this is an example of a high grade tumor. Here we can see that uh, there's a very high choline telling us there is a very high uh, mitotic activity, a lot of uh, densely packed, dense uh, cellular uh, tumor. And the NAA, which is marker of uh, normal neurons, is almost uh, absent. Uh, so this is how uh, the tumors are graded as the tumors become more uh, de-differentiated or more higher grade. We expect that the choline would keep going up and the NAA peaks would uh, go down. A very important uh, function which we can find from MR spectroscopy, which is hard to document on conventional imaging, is the peritumoral uh, focal region. Here we can see a GBM with uh, necrosis and avid enhancement. And this region adjacent to the tumor just shows visogenic edema on the conventional imaging. And uh, But we all know higher grade tumors would uh, infiltrate into the peritumoral uh, normal looking brain parent comma as well. And we do get an evidence of that uh, with this MR spectroscopy when we place a voxel, not in the region of the tumor, but actually within the um, visogenic edema, we see that it still shows a tumor metabolic uh, spectrum with very high choline and almost very low and, a, and we also get a lipid lactate peak, which tells us uh, uh, there's uh, tumoral necrosis. So uh, these regions very important because uh, uh, pre-operative planning definitely can help in pre-operative planning and even on uh, follow-ups uh, to document if there is tumor infiltration in the peritumoral region. So uh, by default, MR perfusion imaging is the most commonly used and I believe most helpful of all uh, for functional imaging regarding brain tumors. Um, it uh, is a great uh, imaging tool which can predict the tumor grade and actually when there's a, a discrepancy between conventional imaging and MR perfusion based on grading, uh, we prefer to upgrade the tumor based on perfusion findings rather than conventional imaging uh, and I'll show you some examples. It definitely helps us in predicting of uh, disease recurrence and target area biopsies and obviously tumor uh, treatment responses. So regarding tumor grade, as we would imagine that uh, the tumors, when they become higher grade, they become, they develop more uh, new angiogenesis and uh, they get more blood flow in them and uh, more perfusion. So the most commonly used uh, variant is uh, relative cerebral blood volume. So you might say that the, might the cerebral blood volume and compare it with the contralateral normal appearing white matter. In our practice, we just do visual assessments. I don't uh, typically measure what is the RCBV absolute value. Uh, I think even eyeballing gives you a fairly good idea if it is high perfusion because uh, we get these colored um, spectrum with all the perfusion images so you can uh, see if it is higher or on the lower side. So this is a, a well-defined tumor, no visogenic edema, no enhancement and as expected uh, low 
RCBV on perfusion turned out to be a grade two oligoastrocytoma. This in comparison is a high grade glioma. All the features support on conventional imaging uh, of a higher grade restricted diffusion surrounding significant vasogenic edema, internal necrosis. And this is uh, true uh, by perfusion as well with a very high cerebral blood volume. Uh, these tumors are straightforward where we have a low grade and uh, supported by perfusion imaging and high grade on conventional and supported by perfusion. And the uh, real function of perfusion comes when the conventional imaging tells you that it's a low grade tumor. For example, this is a left insular based lesion uh, involving the left subfrontal region involving the Broca's area as well. So this is a very well-defined tumor, internal cystic areas, not necrosis, and no surrounding dysgenic edema, very well-defined, no obvious enhancement on uh, post-contrast images. Based on just these conventional images, uh, anybody can easily label it's a low-grade tumor until we get the functional imaging. And we did both MR spectroscopy as well as perfusion in this patient. Uh, this is the MR spectroscopy when the voxel is placed here. You see very high choline and NA is almost uh, very, very uh, low peak. And uh, the same is true for perfusion, very high relative cerebral blood volume in the region of the tumor. Uh, definitely, it uh, was a higher grade tumor. The tumor was partially resected and uh, turned out to be uh, higher grade glioma. So this is a, a, a beautiful example how the perfusion helps in aiding you the creating of tumor. Uh, another example of uh, posterior fossa lesions, if you look at conventional imaging, they almost look uh, similar uh, with a large cystic lesion and a mural enhancing nodule. Uh, and with all our uh, knowledge, we are comfortable saying that it's a pilocystic, uh, pilocystic astrocytoma. The same is true for this tumor, although we see some more heterogeneity within the enhancing uh, nodule. But the major difference comes in uh, when we do perfusion for this tumor, the relative cerebral blood volume is pretty low as compared to the RCBV in this enhancing nodule, which shows very high CBV. So definitely AIDS, uh, we are not dealing with something lower grade. Uh, the pilocytic astrocytomas would not uh, give you this high RCBV. So even preoperatively, the surgeon is uh, uh, preempted and uh, he plans his surgery and that he's dealing with a higher grade tumor to maximize his resection. Uh, another important uh, finding which uh, we can use the perfusion imaging for is uh, differentiating between primary tumor versus solitary metastasis. And the whole concept is that both in primary tumor and solitary meds, then the RCBV will be high in the region of the tumor. And the difference between the two is basically a peritumoral uh, region, which appears as vasogenic edema on conventional imaging. And uh, since gliomas tend to infiltrate within the surrounding uh, tissues, as we saw previously on MR spectroscopy, uh, but uh, because these are intrinsic glial cell tumors and they would, uh, uh, they would have microscopic invasion, which is not visible on uh, conventional imaging. Uh, in contradiction, the metastases are extrinsic tumors. And so they come and just grow as a cluster. They don't infiltrate into the surrounding tissue. So since we can imagine that uh, glial cells infiltrate, so the perfusion CBV will be very high in the region of the tumor but it will also be intermediate in the surrounding tissue. And then as we go more distal uh, to the tumor, it will become normalized. However, in metastasis, the region of the enhancing tumor will show very high CBV and the surrounding uh, vasogenic edema on conventional imaging will not show any increase in CBV. Actually, it would be low as compared to the other side and then it will become normalized. So an important consideration, this is an example of uh, how it looks like. We can see that there is a very uh, necrotic looking uh, tumor, aggressive looking tumor in the periurulandic region on the left side, surrounded by visogenic edema on conventional imaging, very hard to differentiate if it's a true primary glial cell tumor or a metastatic deposit. When we do perfusion, 
you, you can see very well delineated lesion on perfusion imaging. Uh, the surrounding uh, tissue white matter shows actually reduced CBV as compared to the other side. Uh, definitely pointing us uh, more towards in favor of metastasis rather than uh, primary glial cell tumor. In contrast, this is a primary GVM tumor, uh, necrotic tumor uh, surrounding visogenic edema. And perfusion actually tells you that this is the, the primary tumor. And if you look at the surrounding uh, tissue, it is not uh, low as compared to the other side. Actually, it does demonstrate regions of uh, slightly higher uh, CBB as compared to the other uh, side. So definitely telling us there is infiltration of the tumor beyond the margins of the enhancing tumor, uh, suggesting a primary glial cell high-grade tumor. Um, a very important uh, clinical scenario, which we often uh, come across in neuroimaging is uh, if it's a uh, tumor effective uh, um, demyelinating lesion or it's a primary glial uh, tumor. I'm sure we all have come across this and uh, it is very hard to differentiate between the two on based on only conventional imaging and perfusion actually gives you an instantaneous answer to in most of the cases to differentiate between the two. Uh, so again, a well-defined lesion, no surrounding visogenic edema, um, no significant restricted diffusion, uh, minimal enhancement along the margin of this tumor and again incomplete uh, ring of enhancement uh, along this lesion and we are not sure what we are dealing with uh, until we do a perfusion and perfusion gives you an instantaneous answer. Uh, there is no increased cerebral blood volume in this demyelinating lesion by default. Uh, these are uh, the, they don't get new angiogenesis so reduce CBV as compared to the uh, astrocytoma or the primary glial cell tumors, which have increased CBV. So another very important uh, consideration uh, in neuroimaging is uh, progression, whether it's a true progression or a pseudo progression, because radiation chemotherapy, they will uh, uh, kill the malignant cells, but then they break down the blood brain barrier, which result, can result in enhancement and pseudo progression. So this is a characteristic example of pseudo progression. This is a post surgical MRI scan showing surgical bed with the surrounding visogenic or T2 hypertense signal abnormalities, a slight enhancement along the surgical bed, no increased on perfusion. And when after the treatment, while the treatment was going on, there's in, we can see obvious increase in the surrounding visogenic edema and uh, even development of an enhancing nodule. But again, when we look at it on uh, perfusion, there is a low perfusion uh, on the, in the surrounding uh, visogenic edema, uh, definitely a pseudo progression rather than true progression. We follow up with this patient, uh, these uh, uh, findings resolve over time. Uh, again, uh, when the patients are getting radiation therapy, important thing is whether it's a radiation necrosis or it is tumor recurrence. Again, very, very helpful in this situation as a relative cerebral blood volume. This is an example of radiation uh, necrosis. They can look as bizarre as any of uh, enhancing tumor. They can have mass effect with genic edema. But the thing is, they will never have an increased cerebral blood volume on perfusion imaging. So very helpful uh, to do perfusion in all these cases. We do them routinely and uh, perfusion helps us a lot in most of the cases. So this is uh, another very good example uh, uh, from one of the patients. He had this uh, left insular and uh, uh, frontal tumor which was uh, resected and then he had been radiated. We can see some post-surgical changes in surrounding visogenic edema, some enhancement on perfusion. It is all low, there was no evidence of recurrence. On follow-up imaging, uh, adjacent to this uh, uh, post-surgical changes, we saw a well-defined nodule adjacent to the frontal horn of left lateral ventricle um, with some increase in visogenic edema as well. Uh, it was enhancing, and then when we did a perfusion, perfusion showed very high RCBV, so definitely a recurrent tumor. So very helpful tool in ascertaining these conditions. 
I will briefly talk about other uh, functional and other uh, tools which we use in neuroimaging. Basically, functional MRI is to look at the is for surgical planning and to localize the eloquent brain regions, particularly speech and motor, before surgical resection of the tumors. This is a characteristic example. The tumor is in the left ventral region, which uh, on conventional imaging, it is hard to see the relation of it with the uh, eloquent uh, motor strip. And this is uh, the location of the right uh, hand with finger tapping. And the tumor was definitely away from it and very safely surgically resected without any deficit. Another example on the uh, right side, this is the tumor, just to be sure that is away from the uh, hand motor region. Uh, functional imaging was done and a complete surgical resection was uh, obtained without any deficit. So it definitely helps uh, in um, pre-surgical planning, particularly if the tumors are close to speech area, Broca's, Wernicke's, and uh, the motor strip. Uh, another thing which we do, uh, not very oftenly, but if there's a concern, uh, if the tumor is close to the corticospinal tracts or other tracts and to see if the tumor is just pushing or invading them, this is a characteristic example of one of our patients here. We can see that uh, there's a tumor in the left uh, paracentral region involving the paracentral lobule as well sitting right at the um, region of the uh, motor strip for the uh, foot and leg, uh, enhancing tumors surrounding mesogenic edema, definitely higher grade. We did an MR spectroscopy, very high choline, uh, reduced NA, tumor metabolites are all uh, pointing towards higher grade tumor. And since the surgeons had to go and uh, resect it or plan it, we did uh, 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 functional MRI, this is the region localization of the with finger tapping of the hand. And unfortunately, this is the uh, foot region, uh, motor region for the uh, foot, which was just sitting at the top of the tumor. Based on these findings, obviously, the tumor was uh, uh, not resectable. And even to identify the region for the biopsy, it definitely helped the surgeons a lot to avoid these regions. And we can merge them in neuro navigation in the M in the OR suite, uh, so the surgeons can avoid these regions. And the same is true for DTI. Here we can see that uh, the blue is the corticospinal tract. Here we can see very nice corticospinal tract going down. There is uh, definitely invasion of the corticospinal tract on the left side, uh, uh, as expected. And the same is true. This is the corticospinal tract, very nice, sharp, crisp. We don't see the corticospinal tracts here, meaning they are invaded by the tumor. And this was the tumor. They just did a biopsy with uh, leaving a significant residual tumor, which was treated with chemoradiation therapy. And here we can see that uh, uh, this is actually telling us how the perfusion can tell us the response uh, to the chemoradiotherapy as well. This is the follow-up imaging showing reduced T2 uh, flare hyperintense signal, reduced enhancement. I actually, the perfusion has almost normalized in this region, so very good response uh, with the therapy. This is all. Um, I'm very grateful to for your patience, and uh, once again, thank you to the organizing committee for giving me a chance to share my experience. Although it's a huge topic and impossible to cover in these 20 minutes but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. And just uh, a quiz, if uh, anybody can find a fish in this picture, they will get a special prize, not from me, but from the organizing committee. Here is the answer. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day, bye-bye. No, not concentrating. I think I've got mic. Uh, I think mute, please. So thank you very much, Dr. Swan Mazur. That was a beautifully illustrated talk. So uh, the next talk will be by, by Dr. Sanjay Prabhu. He's a pediatric neuroideologist at Boston Children's Hospital in USA, and he's a medical director of imaging informatics and 3D lab. He'll be talking on current state of MRI-based radiomics of pediatric brain tumors. Here you go. <laughs> 
morning everyone thank you for the kind invitation to speak at this really um, impressive symposium my topic today is the current state of MRI based radiomics of pediatric brain tumors my name is Dr. Sanjay Prabhu I am a pediatric neurologist at Boston Children's Hospital and the medical director of imaging informatics In today's talk, I will be covering the following topics. What is radiomics and radiogenomics? Why should we care about this and why now? The state of pediatric brain tumor radiomics today with some examples. So limitations of this uh, area of research and for the developments in the area. So let's talk about what is radiomics and radiogenomics. It's a fairly basic discussion, so we get into the meat of the uh, matter as we go along. So what is radiomics? Radiomics is an extraction of handcrafted features from routine imaging studies that quantitatively captures the textural and morphological characteristics of a human tumor. You try and extract quantitative features which are beyond the level of human perception. So here you have a set of imaging studies with uh, uh, MRI plus contrast. Here's the tumor. You segment the tumor and the surrounding areas abnormality. Uh, and create these regions of interest or ROIs and then you extract some features from those uh, which we will talk about like the shape, the histogram, textures etc and then you analyze these features and uh, using um, deep, deep uh, feature extraction uh, and uh, you can use pre-trained convolutional neural networks for example and then correlate them with uh, genetic expression or the survival uh, etc. So radiomics is the extraction of large number of quantitative features from complex clinical imaging arrays. You transform these images now into high dimensional data and this is now subsequently mined to correlate with histological features, underlying genetic mutations and, ge and malignant potential. You correlate the, these features with the grade progression therapeutic, therapeutic effect or overall survival. Radiogenomics, on the other hand, is correlation between the gene expression and radiomic features. So it's the next stage in the, in the process here. The hypothesis being, if you have dissimilar phenotypes of regions of ROI, so once you have done regional interest in a tumor, dissimilarities in the phenotypes is attributable to gene expression features. That is the basis of radiogenomics. In another way, looking at it as genetic changes with phenotypic consequences is reflected in variations of radiomic features. So if you have a tumor which looks different in certain areas, that is a result of some kind of genetic variation and vice versa. A typical radiomics workflow includes um, starting from imaging, uh, segmentation, feature extraction, machine learning, and validation. So you have to go through this whole process in every case, um, every tumor or every uh, lesion that you take up for radiomics um, research. Segmentation involves separating the tumor and the surrounding abnormality from other tissues. It's a series of algorithms to delineate regions of interest which will form the basis for further steps in the um, radiomics workflow. You separate the uh, lesion and this is a very key step between image processing and quantitative analysis and when done well this can prove a basis for good studies. When done badly it can affect your subsequent uh, research uh, what, however well you do the subsequent steps. Feature extraction is the use of existing features to calculate a feature set with higher degree of extraction. It refers to algorithms for calculating a certain feature. And these extracted features then go through feature selection. And these top features are integrated with clinical and pathological results. And these uh, features are then input into machine learning methods to build prediction or classification models. Quantitative features exhibit different levels of complexity 
and express properties of uh, things like lesion shape, the voxel intensity histogram, and secondarily of the spatial arrangement of the intensity values at the voxel level. These are extracted either directly from the images or after applying different filters or transforms. The various subgroups of uh, quantitative features, including the shape features, which describe obviously the shape of the traced regions of interest and its geometric uh, properties such as volume, maximum diameter along different orthogonal directions, uh, maximum surface, the tumor compactness and sp uh, the spherical nature of the uh, shape. For example, the surface to volume ratio of speculated tumors will show higher values than that of tumors of similar volume. First of the statistics describe the distribution of individual voxel values without concern for spatial relationships. These are histogram properties reporting the mean, the medium, the maximum, minimum values of voxel intensity system image, as well as the skewness, which is asymmetry, the kurtosis, which is the flatness of the lesion, uniformity, and the randomness or an entropy. Second order statistics uh, are um, more like textual features, and these are um, obtained by calculating the statistical interrelationships between predetermined distance along a fixed direction of the what's called the gray run level run length matrix of the G GLRM, and quantifying quantifying consecutive voxels with a similar intensity along fixed directions. And then you have higher order statistic features which are uh, obtained by statistical methods by applying filters or mathematical transforms to images. Uh, for example, if you're trying to um, identify repetitive or repetitive repeating or non-repetitive patterns, uh, suppressing noise, or highlighting certain details. Uh, these are um, in another uh, area of ex examples would be uh, fractal analysis or uh, Laplacian transforms of Gaussian filtered images. Uh, which can extract areas with increasingly coarse structural patterns. So this is just a very brief introduction to the area of thermodynamics. So um, the more important question is, why should we care, and why should we care now? Basically, there are potential applications of radiomics, right? You can identify primary tumors. You can differentiate different kinds of tumors, for example. I'll give an example of an ATRT from a medulloblastoma or medulloblastoma of ependymoma, and you can do this better than you can do with just the human eye. You can also refine differential diagnosis. You can grade tumors. Uh, you can evaluate mutation status and predict treatment response, and you can identify recurrence. The next question is, why should we care now? What makes it more relevant for our times today? As you all know, there's a changing landscape of tu brain tumor classification. The latest classification of the WHO just came out a couple of months back, and this uh, again stresses the integrated diagnosis layered reports and the matrix approach to integrated diagnosis. So what does this mean? This means that brain tumors are now classified into specific types and subtypes. They are graded. Uh, to grades 1 and 4, like we always used to do. Histological features still relevant, which includes monotic activity, anaplastic nuclear features, micro microvascular proliferation, necrosis, and then you have molecular profiling, which is now a key feature. So in addition to histological staining, which we've always done, we also have a very uh, detailed pathological diagnosis pathway, which now includes things like methylone profiling, next generation sequencing, and whole genome sequencing. Uh, this helps you to arrive at a more uh, ac accurate diagnosis uh, and classify the tumor based on the 2021 uh, classification of the WHO. So the layered report structure includes integrated diagnosis. Uh, this includes histological diagnosis, the, the, the grade of the tumor, and the molecular information, where histology refers to what type of cell does this tumor resemble, um, which is the first question. Question two is how do the cells look and behave? So nuclear atypia, mitosis, microvascular proliferation, necrosis, and then finally the molecular typing, for example, IDH mutation or the BRAF status, etc. So basically all tumors now have this kind of layered report structure. 
it's challenges to that's been opposed to the WHO classification is that it is costly to get genetic analysis done. There's always some delay in getting molecular diagnosis uh, confirmed, especially in some parts of the world where it's hard to access this kind of um, uh, genetic analysis. And there's also variability in histological and molecular diagnosis. So you get uh, different specialists who come up with different interpretations of the same um, genetic profile. and there's limited subspecialist expertise, so certain centers have more expertise than throughout the world. So radiomics and regenomics, I believe, has a potential role to play in mitigating some of these challenges. So let's talk about the cell pediatric brain tumor radiomics today. Give you three examples to show you why this uh, is important. Some specific examples here would include metalloblastoma. It's a heterogeneous disease. There are four molecular subtypes, subgroups. Um, we have the wingless, sonic hedgehog, the group three and group four. And they have distinct de developmental origins, unique transcriptional profiles, diverse phenotypes, and varying clinical outcomes. And you have to correlate these non-invasive imaging features like radio phenotypes and genomic data and molecular markers to come up with a good radiomics-based profiling of these tumors. So this has been done in lots of studies uh, in the recent uh, years. And uh, some of these uh, features are things like lateral light cellular location for the sonic hedgehog type subgroup, uh, CP angle location for the wind subgroup, inferior location with dilatation of superior recess for fourth ventricle for group four tumors, uh, minimal enhancement of the primary tumor and epinephal metastases with mismatching pattern as a specific feature for group four metalloblastomas. And then that the profile is based on spectroscopy to try to differentiate sonic hedgehog from non wind and non uh, sonic hedgehog metalloblastomas. Um, and then other nomograms have been established to try and um, predict which kind of tumors are uh, sonic hedgehog uh, type subgroups. Uh, these are not specific because I have tried to apply these in practice, and this does not always come out to be, you know always true, but this gives you a guideline, uh, but you still have to have tissue biopsy at the end to confirm these. We are still not at the point where we can just rely on this for um, diagnostic purposes. So here's an example of a tumor in a six-year-old uh, child um, who uh, came in with this tumor in the posterior fossa. This is a metalloblastoma. Uh, it's a midline location. Uh, it is uh, fa fairly homogeneous looking hypointense, T2 hypointense mass in the midline involving the vermis in the fourth ventricle. And there's no significant, there's, you notice there's no very tumoral edema. Uh, it's diffusion restricted, and uh, there's a fairly solid looking tumor. You don't see too many peritumoral cysts or any macro cysts. Enhancement is a little patchy. You see some areas of enhancement, some areas of non-enhancement as well. And then you have leptomeningeal metastases in the cerebellar folia here. So if you use the, uh, the radiogenomics um, chart here. Um, this is group three metalloblastoma based on the midline location. It is uh, abuts the dorsal brainstem, has this kind of a fluffy looking enhancement, some patchy looking areas here. Um, T2 weighted uh, images, which is hypo intense and homogeneous, which it is. Uh, there's no edema, which again, this is a specific feature of uh, um, group threes, and uh, also wind can have a similar one as well. But notice that group four, group three, and Vint can all have very similar looking, um, have similar, uh, similarly will have less peritumoral edema. Um, and then your intertumoral hemorrhage is absent, uh, which is only seen usually in the Vint types. So this kind of fits with this profile, right? Uh, although you don't actually have much hydrocephalus, we did not have a spinal metastasis in this case, and there was no peritumoral cyst. So not all the features fit, but it's more likely than not that this is a group three metalloblastoma. So next we go on to uh, the, uh, just look at the uh, different subgroups and how clearly they fit. And you can see that they, if you just look at them with the human eye, it can be different, difficult to differentiate the features, which is why radiomix comes in, because it can extract features that you cannot typically see with the human eye and put together. But you still do the same things that you do now uh, but you might use radiogenomics as a 
uh, extra additional layer to uh, refine your diagnosis. The other area this has been used is to differentiate ATRT from medulloblastomas. So ATRTs and medulloblastomas have similar imaging and histological features, but different outcomes. And in this study uh, by Dr. Yom from uh, um, uh, Stanford, uh, they extracted some uh, 1,800 features um, of these tumors and uh, then reduced them to have uh, uh, multiple uh, features to reduce them to three to four and they found that these three top features here uh, are voxel intensity in the 90th percentile, inverse difference moment normalized which is one of the um, second order features, kurtosis which is the flatness of the tumor and these are all derived from the all two weighted images. So basically you can use a two weighted image to try and differentiate ATRT from medulloblastomas. And most importantly, they found that how brightly or faintly a tumor enhanced was not a distinguishing feature between these two tumors, which is contrary to what many of us will think uh, if you do it with a human eye. The other area where this is all radiomix genomics has also been used is to uh, in the ATRT subgrouping, and we're doing, currently doing a study right now on this. Uh, ATRT is at atypical teratoid derived by tumor. It's a tumor that occurs in young children. It has a very, very poor prognosis. Uh, we have the largest number of survivors of ATRT in Boston, um, but uh, we still are no, no, no closer to getting a good diagnostic um, pathway to identify different subgroups. And also, um, the treatment is still uh, being worked out. Uh, basically, uh, in ATRT, uh, there's recurrent genetic alterations uh, of, of uh, the SMARC B1, or rather the SMARC A A4, um, and, uh, but on a genetic level, they're very heterogeneous. And uh, a study from this group uh, in Germany has come up with uh, these three molecular subgroups, uh, the subsonic hedgehog type, the, the tyrosine type and the MYC type, and uh, these have genetic, distinct genotypic chromatin and functional landscapes. And knowing that MR surrogates for these subgroups might contribute to risk assessment and individual certification within frameworks of radiogenomics. So we're currently looking at um, some kind of radiogenomic markers uh, for ATRT. So we talked about some examples here of how you can differentiate different tumors from each other like ATRT medulloblastoma, the subgroups of medulloblastoma are uh, tumors where we don't actually have much of a diagnostic pathway uh, to separate the different tumors and try to develop treatments based on those like an ATRT. Uh, what are the limitations? Of so the limitations of the uh, radiomics or radiogenomics uh, primarily is standardization. Standardization is the basis of robustness, reproducibility, and generalizability. Current standards lack results validation. There are incomplete results reports and unidentified confounding variables in the source database, especially for retrospective data. Uh, there have been evaluation systems uh, which have been proposed uh, comprising of weighted metrics to determine the workflow completeness, the model quality, and clinical adaptation potentiality of uh, radiomic studies. Uh, something called radiomics quality scores, or RQS, uh, and these are um, going some way to standardize this uh, area of research. Uh, another important area where you have limitations is uh, reproducible segmentation, and this can be challenging for things like brain tumors where the edges of the lesions may not be as clearly visible as, say, a uh, lesion um, elsewhere, uh, different other, other types of lesions in the body. Uh, the MR images that we often receive on institutions often lack technical parameters like scanner stent voxel size, which can also make a difference. And the repeatability and reproducibility of results can be challenging. So what are the further developments in this area? So the further developments would include, uh, the dream would be to have large numbers of features Excited from numerous pathologically confirmed patients and develop this large scale database of uh, tumor classification. And basically, deep, deep learning over time can help to build more uh, sophisticated classifiers and help discover new correlations between imaging features and gene ex expression. Uh, it re really requires multi institutional collaboration and open availability of source code and data 
uh, and this will allow us to develop these big databases and uh, hopefully help our young patients. Radiomics, I believe, will also accelerate development of histopathology because segmentation and radiogenomics can uh, suggest the best area to biopsy a lesion. So in summary, we have gone through the following areas. What is radiomics and radiogenomics? Why should we care about this and why now? Some examples of how radiomics is being used in brain tumor research today. Some li limitations of this area and for the developments. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. So that was another enlightening and excellent talk by Dr. Sanjay Prabhu. The next speaker will be Dr. Alain Abighanem. He's a professor of radiology at University of Beirut in Lebanon. And he will be talking about response criteria in lymphoma and solid tumors and immunotherapy. So let's start his talk. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for hosting me. My name is Alain Abiranum. I'm an assistant professor of clinical radiology at the American University of Beirut. In the 20 to 25 minutes that I have today, I will talk about the evaluation of CT scans of immunotherapy patients, RESIST versus I-RESIST. To start with, I have no conflict of interest to disclose. This is the outline of my presentation. I will first talk about the classic criteria and imaging as a common language to assess tumor response to therapy. I will then talk about immune-related response evaluations, tumor burden dynamics, and finally, I will talk about immune-related adverse events as pitfalls in imaging. As you all know, advances in cancer therapy are made by continuous evaluation of treatment results and their incorporation in the practice of oncology. It is necessary to develop a common language to describe the results of cancer treatment whether doing so by repeated imaging or repeated blood sampling, for example, to measure tumor markers. Through imaging, we classically have done that using the World Health Organization criteria or WHO criteria introduced in, the 19, in 1979, or through RESIST criteria, response evaluation criteria in solid tumors introduced in 2000 and revised in 2009. The main difference between these two criteria is that WHO is B-dimensional and RESIST is unidimensional. What it means is if we're using WHO, we are measuring the long axis as well as the perpendicular short axis multiplying these two to come up with a value. If we're using a resist, we are only using the longest diameter. Now, you may all be familiar with this table, but to summarize it, if a patient has metastatic disease, we obviously cannot measure every single lesion he has, he or she. So if we're using a RESIST 1.1, we measure a maximum of five lesions. And everything else is considered as non-target lesion or non-measurable disease. For these five lesions in RESIST 1.1, we measure the longest diameter. Then we add these longest diameters. We sum these longest diameters to come up with a number, a value. This value is the one that we compare from baseline to follow up in order to see whether this patient is progressing or whether he has complete response, partial response, or stable disease. If we have greater than 20% increase or a new lesion, this is considered a disease progression. 
if we have a decrease in the sum of the longest diameters of greater than 30%, this is considered partial response. Now, what do we do with the non-measurable disease? We don't ignore it completely. We actually look at the non-measurable disease and we make an assessment. The assessment can, can be either complete response, so disappearance of all lesions, or unequivocal progression, or non-progression of disease. So if the lesions, the non-target, the non-measurable disease or non-target disease persist, we call that non-progression of disease. So at the end, we end up with an assessment for the target lesions and an assessment for the non-target lesions. We combine them to come up with a final overall assessment. So you notice here that what makes a disease progression is either a new lesion in the target disease. I'm sorry, so either a new lesion in the non-target disease that makes it a overall PD or a increase in the sum of the LDs by more than 20% with an at least absolute increase of more than five millimeter. These are examples of non-measurable disease. So this can be miliary metastases, skeletal metastases, ascites, pleural effusions, lymphangitic spread, leptomeningeal disease, inflammatory breast disease, etc. This is an example of a patient who has multiple metastases in the lungs. We have the baseline exam on the left side of the screen and the follow-up exam on the right side of the screen. And you notice that on the follow-up, most of the lung metastases have markedly improved. However, if we scrutinize the upper portion of the abdomen, we notice a new hypoenhancing nodule in the left adrenal gland, therefore indicating that this patient is progressing rather than improving. What are the pitfalls in the selection of target lesions? You all have to remember that the best lesion to measure is the one that is reproducible with the least inter-observer variability. It's not necessarily the largest lesion because I can measure it, let's say in an anteroposterior oblique orientation, whereas another uh, another radiologist can measure it in a transverse uh, orientation. Also, when selecting our target lesions, we have to make sure we're not picking mobile lesions. For example, this patient with metastasis to the ovary, on one scan, the ovary was located anteriorly. And then on another scan, the ovary flipped backwards. So we should avoid these mobile lesions. Also, we have to make sure in target lesions that we are measuring them in the same phase of enhancement. For example, in the arterial phase or in the same portal venous phase. What about the lymph nodes? So RESIST 1.1 measures the lymph nodes in the short axis rather than in the long axis as it was the case in RESIST 1.0. And the criteria for complete response of these lymph nodes in RESIST 1.1 is decrease of their diameter to less than one centimeter. Whereas in 1.0, we had to have complete disappearance of the, node, of the lymph node in order to secure a complete response. So by putting these together, we noticed that in patients where 
nodal disease predominates the tumor burden, complete response criteria in RESIST 1.1 are less stringent than with RESIST 1.0. Now, moving on to immune-related response evaluations, we have two types of immunotherapies. We have the passive immunotherapy and the active immunotherapy. So active immunotherapy entails administering to the patient cytokines or vaccines or immunomodulatory monoclonal antibodies. So how does immunotherapy work? So cancer cells cause genetic uh, genetic mutations that can create antigens. These antigens are not present in normal cells, and therefore they are picked up by the antigen presenting cells within the context of the major histocompatibility complex. This, th these antigens can then be recognized by the T cell through the T cell receptor. In the presence of an appropriate co-stimulatory signal, usually through the CD28 receptor, the T cell receptor ligation with the MHC leads to T cell activation and ultimately to the immune system mediated tumor response. Now, the T cell activation is balanced by inhibitory pathways known as immune checkpoints. Cancer cells can disrupt these pathways to escape immune system mediated tumor destruction. Now, in immunotherapy, we use monoclonal antibodies to block these immune checkpoints, such as antibodies against CTLA-4 in ipilimumab, or antibodies against either the PD-1 receptor or the PDL-1 ligand in nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and atezolizumab. So these immune checkpoint inhibitors have been approved. The following immune checkpoint inhibitors have been approved by the FDA. Uh, for example, ipilimumab in uh, melanoma, nivolumab, pembrolizumab in melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, renal cell carcinoma, urothelial cancer, and also in Hodgkin lymphoma in hematological diseases such as Hodgkin lymphoma. We also have uh, PDL1 inhibitors such as atezolizumab that is approved in non-small cell lung cancer and urothelial cancer. So how this the classic paradigm of response assessment change from the classic, from the cytotoxic agents to the immunotherapy age, immunotherapeutic agents. In cytotoxic, in the cytotoxic uh, chemotherapy and using WHO and RESIST criteria, any early increase in tumor size or any new lesion indicates progressive disease, therefore resulting in discontinuation of the treatment. So progression became synonymous with drug failure. With immunotherapy, this is different. The appearance of measurable anti-tumor activity may take longer than cytotoxic therapies because here we are harnessing the immune system to react and go and attack the tumor cells. And this mechanism takes time. The discontinuation of treatment also may not be appropriate in some cases of patients treated with immunotherapy unless disease progression is confirmed. <laughs> 
In immunotherapy also, we allow for clinically insignificant progression of disease, such as small new lesions in the presence of other responsive lesions. This is completely different than in cytotoxic agents where any new lesion is considered disease progression. Also in, immun in immunotherapy, a durable stable disease is actually accepted as anti-tumor activity or as efficacious drug. So with the immune checkpoint inhibitor treatments, we have noticed two new unconventional response patterns. So remember, with the cytotoxic agents, we have described four types of response. We have described disease progression, stable disease, partial response, and complete response. With immunotherapy, we can have response after an increase in tumor burden, we can have response during or after appearance of new lesions. And sometimes we can have a protracted response even after we stop the medication, the patient keeps responding month after stopping the treatment. So here in this patient, as you can see, the lung nodule in the right lower lobe medially increases after 12 weeks of initiating the medication. And then two years after, uh, and then 24 weeks after, it starts improving. Same thing in the anterior abdomen, we have the subcutaneous nodule, which was not present at baseline. So it appeared at 12 weeks and then disappeared at 24 weeks. So this is a new pattern of response that was not described with cytotoxic agents using the WHO criteria and using the RESIST criteria. So with the advent of immunotherapy, clearly there was a need to develop a new response criteria to assess for uh, to assess whether the treatment is efficacious or not. And multiple criteria actually emerged. The first one that emerged was a B-dimensional criteria aligned with the WHO criteria. And that was called IRRC or immune-related response criteria. This was followed by the IR resist criteria that were developed in 2013 and the immune response criteria in solid tumors that was developed and in introduced in 2017. So the IR resist and the I resist try to align themselves with the resist criteria, meaning that these are unidimensional. We only measure the longest diameter we pick a maximum of five target lesions, two max per organ. And then we use the same, the, the same thresholds to, uh, to call uh, disease progression or partial response. So for disease progression, more than 20% increase in the total tumor burden and if we have an improvement of more than 30% of the total tumor burden, we call partial response. Now what's different or the novelty that was introduced by iResist is the concept of immune unconfirmed progressive disease. So anytime we have a new lesion in a patient who is being treated with immunotherapy, we cannot immediately say that this is disease progression. We have to confirm it after at least four weeks by repeated imaging. And in the meantime, 
this new lesion is not included in the total tumor burden. This is what makes it different with IR resist. So as I said, I resist was introduced in 2017 by the resist working group and immunotherapy subcommittee. It aligns itself with resist 1.1. It introduced the concept of immune unconfirmed progression of disease which means that APD by RESIST 1.1 remains to be confirmed in the next scan in four to eight weeks. If this is confirmed in four to eight weeks by showing either further increase or additional disease, then we can include it in the total tumor burden calculations. So again, new lesion measurement at baseline is not included in the sum. They are recorded and measured separately. If the disease is confirmed afterwards in four weeks, then we assign it to the tumor burden. And then we can say that we have immune confirmed progression of disease, ICPD. Now, what is this dilemma between B-dimensional and versus unidimensional measurements, whether we are talking about RESIST versus WHO or IRRC versus IR-RESIST or I-RESIST? So a trial, so the, a trial uh, using IRRC was done, including 57 patients with advanced melanoma treated with ipilimumab. So they took these patients and they measured them both ways. They measured them with two dimensions and they measured them using a single dimension, so the longest diameter. And they compared the results basically, and they assessed, so the results were compared and they assessed for inter-observer variability and for time to progression. And it was noted that if we use unidimensional measurement, we have less variability between different observers. So we have a better limit of agreement if we are using unidimensional measurement compared to b-dimensional measurement. Here, for example, you see that the observers are all over the place compared to the median, whereas here we have a better agreement. Uh, we have a, a better agreement basically between the different observers. So the conclusion is unidimensional measurement has better inter-observable variability and better agreement between observers, between radiologists. Also with unidimensional measurement, we noticed a longer time to progression compared to B-dimensional measurements. So we tend to call progression earlier when we use two dimensions compared to a single dimension. Now, moving on also to tumor burden dynamics in immunotherapy. In melanoma treated with PD-1 inhibitors, we have in this trial, these different patients who responded. And you can see that we have multiple patterns of response. Those who progressed, and then those who improved over time or remained stable. And you notice also these patients who initially got worse and then responded, initially got worse and then responded. 
This is what I actually described early on in this talk. This is what we say pseudo progression. This is what we call a pseudo progression. And pseudo progression may reflect either a continued tumor growth until a sufficient immune response develops or transient immune cell infiltrate with or without edema. And because of that, we actually request or confirm with a subsequent scan whether we have a true response or whether this patient is progressing. Now you have to remember that anytime we have an increase in tumor burden or an appearance of a new lesion, most of the time, these patients are progressing, but there's, all, there's always a small subset of patients who develop this pseudo progression that revolves around 7% of patients, especially in melanoma. Now in non-small cell lung cancer treated with PD-1 inhibitors, pseudo progression is extremely rare phenomenon. This is the, an example of a patient with lung cancer who has a pseudo progression. Another pattern that was also described is hyperprogression, which means that we have a rapid progression with dramatic tumor burden increase from baseline to the first follow up after the introduction of immunotherapy. So, Usually, this is a greater than twofold increase of the tumor between the baseline and the first follow up. Mm. Now, I don't know if this is a, a, a true pattern of response, but it has been described uh, by, this, by the French group in Paris. And they actually say that it is anecdotally noted in patients, with treated, in patients treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And this is the example that they actually reported. So we have at baseline a metastasis in the right hepatic lobe. And then at eight weeks of therapy, of immunotherapy, we have a dramatic worsening and multiple new lesions that's, that's uh, you know, involving both hepatic lobes, this is rapid or hyper progression. Now, the final thing I would like to talk about in this presentation are the pitfalls in imaging uh, of patients with immunotherapy. These are mostly related to the immune related adverse events. So, as we, as as I said earlier, in immunotherapy, we are triggering the immune system to attack the neoantigens of the tumor or the tumor cells uh, themselves. And by triggering our immune system, sometimes we can go into an overdrive and cause uh, inflammations all over in, in, in all the organ systems of the body. So for example, we can have inflammation of the pituitary gland in here. So enlargement and enhancement of the pituitary gland. We can have pneumonitis. We can have hepatitis. We can have E. colitis. All of these are immune mediated adverse events. And we have to be aware of them when we are looking at our scans in order not to call, for example, infection or not to call, so an infection pneumonitis or an infectious hepatitis or infectious colitis, because obviously the treatment will differ. In patient with infection, this patient has to receive, for example, antibiotics, but in patient with an immune related inflammation, maybe they need to receive steroids. Sarcoid-like lymphadenopathy has been described in patients with melanoma and other, uh, and other types of cancer. Uh, 
uh, treated with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors around five to seven percent. They can be clinically silent. They can manifest as uh, mediastinal adenopathy, bilateral hilar adenopathy, as well as lung parenchymal changes. So it's important to be aware of this adverse event because we don't want to uh, mistake these into calling them metastases or disease progression. As I said, uh, PD-1 inhibitor induced pneumonitis. This is also rare, but it can occur. It can be clinically serious and potentially life-threatening. Uh, we can have patchy airspace opacities as well as ground glass bilaterally in both lungs. Now, in the era of COVID, obviously, uh, this complicates our job, but uh, we always have to uh, look into the clinical history look into the labs, uh, see when the new uh, medication was introduced and try to make a judgment. Incidence rates, usually around 3% in more monotherapy trials and around 7% in combination trials. So in conclusion, imaging serves as a common language for tumor response assessment during immunotherapy. It is important to recognize that measuring tumor size is not always equivalent to evaluating tumor response. We have to be aware of the immune-related response phenomena and the pitfalls that are associated with them. And we as radiologists play critical roles at the front line of treatment monitoring in cancer patients treated with immunotherapy. So with that, I conclude my presentation and I'm ready to take your questions. These are my references. And finally, this is a view of our campus in Beirut. So Dr. Amir, please go ahead. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks all you know, for uh, taking your time and uh, taking us through such an inf informative talks. So my first question is with uh, Dr. Uh, Fariti, John Fariti, uh, regarding follow-up for dysplastic nodules. Of course, we can talk about low and high-grade dysplastic nodules. So what do you recommend in terms of the interval? And also, uh, do you think we should go for like targeted MRs, limited sequence, and if we will, what sequence you will prefer? So I, I, if I'm hearing the question correctly, it was with regard to follow-up for high-grade dysplastic nodules and interval of follow-up. Is that right? Uh, yeah, uh, low and high-grade, of course, the interval might be different. And second, if we are going to follow them up with MR, what limited sequences uh, you, know, you may prefer? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, at at uh, my institution, what we would usually do is something on the order of three to six months, depending on how concerned you were for the lesion. If it was, you, you know, you're sure it's a dysplastic nodule, but you're not necessarily thinking high grade and more on the six month timeline and shorter timeline. If you were, if you were getting concerned uh, that there might be progression either towards high grade dysplasia or, or hepatocellular carcinoma. And as far as the sequences, nothing specific, really, just typical sequences, T1, T2, and then post-contrast imaging uh, generally is sufficient uh, in order to get you the information that you want. And you want to go out um, to make sure that you get arterial phase, portal venous, delayed phase. In case there is progression of hepatocellular carcinoma, then you'll be able to see washout and perhaps even capsular enhancement. Uh, but the T2-weighted imaging and the post-contrast imaging is really going to be the driver as far as being able to differentiate those nodules from progression to hepatocellular cancer. So it uh, looks, looks like we, we are run out of okay. time and we don't have many uh, audience questions. And uh, Dr. Amir, would you like to uh, ask another question? Yeah, just uh, one more question to Dr. Amar, uh, please. Uh, you know, in terms of... Uh, the treatment in terms of for a liver lesion, especially XCC, how does tumor invasion, i.e. angio invasion, affects your uh, treatment? Of course, one is size criteria. The other is uh, if there's angio invasion, 
will it change your decision whether you're going to ablate it microwave it or not yeah no i think um we have definitely moved away from uh ablating tumors uh which have a vascular invasion because there's a risk of uh um dis tumor dissemination if you do that uh, most patients who have uh, intravascular invasion, if you're treating them with local regional therapies, we're treating them with usually with transarterial therapies. Um, and I think in the US and Western Europe, radioembolization has really taken over chemoembolization. But I think in the East, um, uh, in the Far East, people are still using um, uh, chemoembol selective chemoembolization as well with uh, good results. So I would say uh, but there's a trend towards radioembolization just because it's uh, thought to be more effective um, uh, for, for that particular cohort. I think it also depends on what the degree of portal vein invasion is. Segmental and low bar is always better than main um, from a therapeutic standpoint. Thank you very okay. much. So, yep. so thank you very much. Uh, it looks like we had run out of time. And um, I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, for giving your precious time and your phenomenal talks and I would like to uh, thank the atten attendees who have been with us for the last couple of hours and it's been a great session and uh, I would like to thank Shaukh Khanum Symposium uh, of 20th Symposium. Thank you very much and uh, see you next time. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you. Bye.